God is mighty, God is good. What's wrong? The song? Don't, what do you think? Could be. Just give me a new battery, maybe. Could I have that? Have you got a new battery? You got a new one? There's another one there. Oh, let's try it, let's try it. powerless if it has no power. You thought we was really doing that. We was acting. Wasn't that good? <laughs> You've got Rob up. Look, he's on the... It's powerless if it has no power. This microphone, if it's not actually doing what it needs to do, it's just plastic and metal. Can maybe put it on your mantelpiece if you're weird. But, but, but what's the purpose of it if it's not going to do what it's supposed to do? With no power, we become powerless. We're not as effective as we should be. We strain, we strive. We work in our own strength. We try and do God's work. Anyone done that one? Yeah, you try and do God's job for him, and you realize it's a bit like when you've got a two or three year old and they painted a picture for the first time, yeah? And they know, they're telling you, you know, they're like, you're looking at it, they're saying, oh, it's a rainbow, or it's like that's mommy and daddy, or, and you're looking at it going, that is a mess. Like, that looked like you got all the paint in your hands and you put it all on there and you said it was a rainbow. And that's the kind of thing that we do with God when we try to do it for him. We say, look at what I made. And God said, what have you done? <laughs> that's not what I intended for you. That wasn't my plan for you. A church without power, a Christian without power becomes ineffective. We need the power of God to equip us to work out our own salvation. If you were here last week, you'll know this is part two of last week's. If you weren't here last week and you haven't listened to the message, why not? But second of all, do you think it's the other thing turned on? Oh. Talking about power. Testing, one, two, one, two. All good now, yeah? Should I dance around? It's because I am going to. So, okay. We need the power of God to equip us to work out our own salvation. Continuing on from our message last week. It says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We, we learned that last week, yeah? Yeah, we learned that, yeah? Um, but how? How? Okay, so my analogy last week, yeah, was we're on the treadmill. We go to the gym, yeah, and um, we're Christians, yeah, we, we believe in God, we believe in Jesus. We learned last week that Jesus had breathed on us because we accepted Jesus, we confessed with our mouths and we believed in our heart and he's breathed the Holy Spirit to, within us, yeah, and we're on the treadmill and now we decided that we want God to take care of our sin, we want God to deal with the habit that we've got, we want God to provide for something, we want God to give us um, the job that we're asking for. And so we go to the gym, the, Christ, the, the spiritual gym this is. We go to the spiritual gym, we get on the treadmill, and we stand there. And then we go, oh, Lord, will you give me the body I am not willing to work for in Jesus' name? And I was saying, like, can you imagine going to the gym? The person next to them is like, and you're just stood on the treadmill. It's all turned off. And you're just going, fitter in Jesus' name. 
Make me the Adonis in Jesus' name. And they're looking at you going, what are you doing? And yet Christians do that. It's not that he's not in you. It's that you have no power. Because you've got to turn the treadmill on and you've got to work at it. You've got to work out your own salvation. But to do that, you've got to turn the power on. Yeah? And then we're running, walking probably, first of all. And we're on the treadmill. We need power. God is saying, the person, they say the person next to you is God. He's running. And he's like, mate, you've just got to turn it on. That, you, all the things you're asking for is only going to happen if you turn it on. Yeah? And I was thinking about this, is that when we're on the treadmill, finally, because we've learned a lesson, that we can't just blab it, grab it, yeah? That we actually have to work out our salvation. So we're now on the treadmill. And then we decide when we go fast. We decide when we go slow. We decide when we go up, which is not very often usually if you're on the treadmill. But you decide to do those things. And God's like, that's not your decision to make either. We just got to get on the treadmill. Yeah? And it's up to God if he's like, I'm going to make an incline now. I'm going to make an ascent. You know, we're going to, and you're like, Lord, why? He's like, higher. And he's like, this is what you need. This is a mountain you've got to get over. Yeah? And sometimes we're just walking. Sometimes we're just walking because it's where we're at. And sometimes we're sprinting. This is my sprint. This is as far as I go. Okay? So, but that is not down to you. It's down to God. We work out our salvation, but we need the power. And the power will dictate how we how we go, where we go, how it works. Whether we're going up, whether we're going down, whether we're going slow, whether we're going fast, that is up to God. You need the power of God in your life. I'm out of breath now after that. Yeah. Now we look at the word powerful, yeah? The word powerful. And we associate that to superheroes. Is that right? Yeah? The word powerful, you think, oh, that's... That's someone mighty, someone powerful, like Thor with his hammer, or Captain America, or Batman, or Superman. You know, someone that's powerful, someone that is strong, someone, someone that has strong authority. We take that word powerful, and as Christians, we don't want to be associated to that word powerful. We don't want to say that Christians are powerful. We don't want that word associated to us because we associate that word to just one, Jesus. Yeah? Is that right? Yeah? We don't want to be like, I don't want to be associated as being powerful. I don't want to be associated as that because Jesus is the superhero. Yeah? You know, has anyone been to Sunday school or sung the song, Jesus is my superhero? Yeah? Jesus is my superhero. He is, he's the one that, he's the one that's done it. He's the one that's stronger. He is all powerful. So I don't want to be known as powerful. I want to be as far away from that as possible. I want to teach you something today that we're saying the word wrong. From a Christian point of view. Okay? Absolutely, Jesus is our superhero. He's all powerful. And he's out there on his own. Yeah? I think we're all in agreement with that. Yeah? So when people say as Christians we are powerful as a collective sigh can be heard. You know you've given this. We are powerful. We are powerful. People are like, oh, no, not you. Not one of those people. <coughs> Chatting. Great. How long is he talking for? When we compare it to Jesus, we are not. Can I do an exercise with you just to show you how we've got it a little bit wrong? Yeah? I'm going to say some words. Can you say full? Can I just test? One, two, three. Yeah, okay. I'm going to say some words. I'm just going to bring context to what I believe we as Christians need to be when it comes to the power of God. We're not powerful like Jesus. We're not Jesus. Get this. Color. What's that mean? I'll tell you what it means. You don't have to. It's rhetorical. It's full of color. Okay, next. Beauty. That means it's full of beauty. Wonder means it's filled with 
wonder. Peace means you're filled with peace. Help means that you're filled with help. It's who you are. Trust. It means you're filled with trust. Zazas. It means you're full of zazas. Power. It means you're full of power. There's a difference. Yeah? Jesus is the superhero. He's all powerful. Yeah? But we are full of power. Or we can be full of power. Batman is powerful. Superman is powerful. Even people like Putin are powerful. Iron Man's powerful. Elon Musk is powerful. God is all powerful. But Christians are meant to be powerful. Full of power. I'll prove it to you. We're meant to continue being filled with the power of God. We learned this last week that Jesus breathed on the disciples and they received the Holy Spirit. And yet he says, power will come upon you. Yeah? After that fact. So we learn that there must be a process that goes through salvation. When Jesus breathed on them, it was the enactment of salvation. That you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe in your heart and you confess in your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. But what you need from then onwards is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Your salvation is sealed. Confess your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Holy Spirit seals that. That's what Jesus did. But then he says, something's coming. I'm going. The Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to fall on you. And you will receive. This is after Jesus has breathed on them. Yeah? Read it for yourself. After Jesus has breathed on them to receive the Holy Spirit. He says, wait, I'm off, and wait, because the Holy Spirit's coming, and you will receive power. Yeah, read it for yourself. Read it for yourself. What do you mean? Uh, um, Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. um, It's in the Bible. Yeah, read the Bible. Okay, but yeah, um, Acts 1 verse 8, which is at the end of my sermon, which I would bring up at the end, but it's cool. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Acts 1 verse 8. Yeah? But it continues on from Jesus breathed. Yeah, read it for yourself. Go look at it. John, go and read John. Go and read the end of John like we did last week. Or listen to the sermon last week. It will save you a lot of time. And then let it carry on into Acts. And we're going to continue into Acts next week too. Because we're continuing on the story. Do you see... Jesus died, he was buried, he resurrected, he breathed on the disciples, he said, I'm off, and now we're learning that he's now bringing the power. Now we're going to learn what we need to do next. This is our lesson. Simple stuff. We need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling that it would bring glory to God. But to truly do that, to bring glory to God, to impact a world that does not know him, you need to be plugged in. You need power. Not my words, Jesus' words. These guys walked with Jesus for three years. These guys saw everything that Jesus did, and yet Jesus said, you will receive power. And I'll prove it through scripture that we need to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. When you run from the Holy Spirit, when we hide from the Holy Spirit, when we say, oh, when though I saw the Holy Spirit back in the day, it was all a bit messy, I don't like it. 
We are choosing to live an ineffective faith. A broken walk doesn't mean you're not going to walk with God. It doesn't mean that God isn't with you. It just means you're working with like a battery that's about to run out. Or, or something that is just not fully complete. Like we know, Jesus breathed on the disciples. Holy Spirit's there. They're okay. You're okay. But do you want to stay there? Or do you want power? But when you run to him, when you open up to the Holy Spirit, when you make yourself vulnerable and allow him in, you become full of power, power to lead, power to overcome, power to change, power to let go. How are you being filled? At the moment, we've got a bit of a petrol crisis. Well, money crisis, I guess, with petrol. Plenty of petrol. No one wants to buy it. If your car ain't filled up, you're going nowhere. Same for us. And why would we want to reject the Holy Spirit? Why would we want to say that I don't need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? I'll prove to you by some of the most amazing people, disciples, that we register, that we accept, that we say, man, they were mighty men of God. How they had to be filled and then filled. I'll show you. Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them. And they were all they were all, what was it? Filled with the Holy Spirit. They'd already received the Holy Spirit. I read it last week. Did you read it with me? We've already read that. You know that you received the Holy Spirit when you accepted that Jesus was Lord. Confessed your mouth and believed in your heart. And yet, it says they were all, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. The same people that were in that same room. That Jesus turned up. Remember that? And he just turned up in the room. Door was locked. Yeah? Those same people, a few days later, are filled. Received, filled. Isn't it cool when we start bringing out the word and it becomes so clear? And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as of the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together, and they were confused because everyone heard them speak his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all of these who speak Galileans? I.e., they're, they're, not, they're not allowed to do this. And how is it that, that we hear each of, each of them in our own language in which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elem, Elamites, um, who's dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, and all other places, including Egypt, and the parts of Libya, adjoining to other places, and then visitors from Rome, both Jews, proselytes, Cretans, that means something else when I was growing up at school, um, Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what could this mean? Others mocking. There will always be people that will mock as you move in the Holy Spirit. There will always be people that mock the move of God. Just be ready for it. It's going to come. It won't not be there. It will be everywhere. It will come at you from different angles, places you wouldn't expect. Others mocking said, oh, they're full of wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. I spoke about this on Thursday at Revival Nights. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall see dreams. And on my men servants and my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit 
in those days, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heaven above and the signs of the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The first sermon ever spoken was, we are not drunk. First words. This is God. I wonder if we're going to have to say that in the future. God's moving. Carnage is happening. Lives are changing. It looks like a bit of chaos. God's chaos. And we're saying, this is not people being drunk. This is God. This is the power of God. This is what happens when the power of God falls. This is what happens when the power of God, which you've never been witness to because the church shut it away. But it's time to start letting the power of God be seen. It changes lives. It brings people to a place of marveling and amazement. What is going on? Acts 4. They've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you're with me on that one. And it came to pass on the next day that the rulers and the elders and the scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caphius, um, John, and Alexander, and all many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power? <laughs> we don't need the power. Yeah, we don't need it. We need it. By what power or by what name have you done this? What is this? How have you managed? What has happened, just to give you context, is that there was a guy that was lame. He was by the gate, and, um, and he asked them for money. And they say, silver and gold we cannot give you, but this we can. Rise up in the name of Jesus. And he rises up, and then he goes around the temple. And everyone knows who he is because he's always there. And they're like, this is the guy that has been begging. He can't walk. People have to put him there so he can beg. And he's walking around. And so they pull onto one side and they say, what has happened? What is this? How's, how, what power is this? What name are you doing this in? Verse 8. Then Peter. Sorry, what does it say? Could you read it? Failed with the Holy Spirit. Said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. If we this day are judged by a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you and all the people of Israel and by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which, re the, which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation by any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is Peter, mind. Yeah, the one that ran and hid. When he was said, do you know Jesus? He's like, I don't even know who you're chatting about. Listen to this. This is really important. You need to listen to this line because this is going to teach you a lot about your walk with God. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Now, I want to give you two examples if you want to go and look it up. First of all, Peter denies Jesus. There is no boldness in him there, correct? Later on, Jesus has already breathed on him, but he is in shame and he also is uncertain of his future he's fearful of what he's about to do do god can you use can you use me mm, i don't think so he runs he hides he tries to stay away from god you can look those two things up they're there both in john well one's in john um with jesus meeting peter afterwards i'm sure the denying of jesus is in there too john's a good book to read is that right harry and sue yeah, yeah. Excellent book. <laughs> so here, they saw the boldness. Not only has Peter already stood up and preached the very first sermon ever, but he's also here 
and people are seeing the boldness in him and in John. Yes? You reading it with me? Yeah? And they perceived that they were uneducated, untrained men. They marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. And being let go, I've moved on to 23. They basically get reprimanded. They get told off. They basically get told, don't talk about Jesus anymore. Yeah? And it says, being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So when they had heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things and the kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ? For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants, get this, I'm going to go back to this in a bit, grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. What a greedy bunch John and Peter are. Don't you know it's a one-time only thing? You had it at Pentecost, now walk it out. Isn't that what we're meant to believe? We're meant to be being filled. We're meant to continually being filled. Do you see what these guys did? Do you see what these guys did? They were filled at Pentecost. They stood up and they preached a sermon that started the church. And then what happens from there is they're going about their business, just like they learned when, they, when Jesus was walking around about doing his business. They see a guy, the guy comes to them, and he says, can you help me? And they say, we can't give you what you th think you need, but we can give you this. And they pray, and the guy starts walking. They see healing in that moment. Through that healing, there is testimony. Through that testimony comes um, the attack from the enemy, comes persecution. From that persecution, they get taken to one side and said, you need to stop talking about Jesus. But they, because they perceive the boldness that is in them, and they see that they were people that hung around with Jesus. They then leave, so they've gone through that whole process. Do they come out of prison like maybe some of us might have done and be like, did you see? We healed the dude, yeah? We healed the dude. We got taken in prison because we did it, Yeah? And here we are, we got out, we, they let us go, they, told, they slapped us on the wrist and they let us go, but look at what we did, yeah? Whoa, did you see what we achieved? Woo! <laughs> it doesn't say that. It says they go and find their family, that's the first thing. They go and find their church family. Does it say they went off and found God and spent loads of time on their own in, in, on, uh, uh, individually? No, it says as soon as they came out, they went and found their companions. They got around their brothers and sisters and they prayed. Do not forsake the gathering together of the saints. That's scripture too. Okay? That's what they did. The first thing they did after having this experience, good and bad. Yeah? Seeing God move, but then also seeing this amazing, uh, getting, going through persecution. And having to be told, stop talking about Jesus. There will be more consequences if you don't. They gathered together. Now, Peter stood up with boldness, preached the first sermon. Peter and John are seen to have boldness. That it freaks them out. They're marveled at it. How can people like you, uneducated people, how is it possible that you could have this power? How is it that you can have this boldness, this confidence? And yet, those same people that already are seen to have it. Yeah? Yeah? What did they ask for? 
they, they, they don't. They don't. They ask. They ask for more boldness. Now, Lord, look at their threats. Grant your servants that we all, with all boldness, they may speak your word. Isn't that crazy? We're looking at them and going, you've got it, mate. Man, I couldn't do what you're doing. You're already arrived. You've got the boldness. You went and achieved it. You went and did it. And yet they come back, having done something incredible, made a stand for Jesus, and yet ask for more. Doesn't that say that we need to continually be asking God? That we need to be continually being filled? That we continually need to be continually equipped with the things that God gives us, even when he gives us something and it worked? That actually we need to go and get that again? We say, Lord, we need more boldness now? Isn't that what it says? I don't take my word for it. I don't want you to take my word for it. Is that what it says? We learned last week that Jesus breathed on the disciples and they received the Holy Spirit. We learned today that at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell and filled them and power came. I love this about Peter. I mean, we... Peter's ark's incredible, his story. The religious leaders, religious leaders hear them and ask them who they, whose name do they speak in. Peter says, um, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells them exactly who they represent. They are actually taken aback by the boldness of Peter and John. They summon them, they threaten them, and they say, stop saying the name Jesus. Stop talking about him. Do not gather, shut the church doors, start allowing this sin in your church. Yeah? Threats. Compromise. Yeah? Don't, you don't need to go to church anymore. You don't need people. You can do church on your own with your dolls. Yeah? Threats can come. Things can come and say, you don't need to follow God like that. Oh, man, you're too Jesus-y. Anyone been accused of being too Jesus-y? Yeah, I have. Someone said to me once, you speak too much about Jesus. I said, I'll take that. <laughs> when people start getting at you and start saying, we've got to change things. We've got to soften things. Don't talk about Jesus. It's, you know, we can't deny what you've just done, but actually, can you just stop it now, please? Because it's messing about with this stuff that we have here. It's messing about with society. It's messing about with liberalism that we have right now. The church is actually messing about with liberalism. You know that? The standing church, I mean. Do you know it's messing about with it? Because everyone's saying compromise, 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 compromise. And, if, and anyone standing on the word is saying no. And you're like, you're messing up our chi. Yeah? You're messing our balance. You're messing about with our society. And we're like, it ain't your society. It's God's. And whilst I'm not thinking that we're going to change the whole world, whilst I'm breathing, we're going to try our best. To change the world around us. With power. Stop talking about him. Don't gather. Keep the doors shut. Compromise. 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 You don't need to do this anymore. He's not here anymore. He's left you. You know, don't worry about it. Peter, full of the Holy Spirit. Whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God you judge for what we cannot we for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard if there's no power in the believer and there's no power in the church then there's no power to change this world Peter, as we learned, was breathed on by Jesus, received the Holy Spirit, still felt shame, still doubted himself. Peter, who denied Jesus, feared for his life rather than die for Jesus, was full. Do you see what being full of the Holy Spirit can do to someone? We already know his character. To hide, to avoid conflict, to feel pretty low about who you think you are. To allow the past to impact you enough to say, I can't do that because I'm not worthy of it. Anyone relate to those things? I do. Yeah? 
you know what? Those things don't have as much impact on me when I'm filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not that they don't exist. But suddenly, I'm not looking at me anymore. I'm not looking at what was anymore. Power will come upon you when you receive the Holy Spirit. Oh, wow. Do you know what? I don't need to look at that. I don't need to look at my circumstance. I don't need to be dictated by that anymore. This is what happened to Peter. They're in the upper room waiting. They're not really doing much. And the Holy Spirit, bam. And Peter's like, right, guys. I can see there's some confusion about what this might be. This guy that didn't want to associate his name to Jesus, who didn't even know if he was worthy of the calling that God was going to give him, stands up and he says, look, this is not what it looks like. This is Jesus. This is God. This is the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you about who Jesus was. Let me tell you about what he did for you. He stands up bold as anything, full of the Holy Spirit. And then later on, full of the Holy Spirit, when he is told to stop talking about Jesus, when they said, do you know Jesus? And he went, I don't know who you're chatting about. I never knew the guy. Get away from me. I don't know what you're on about. I don't want to be associated with him. He's here. And he's saying, whether I, it's better that I listen to you or God, I ain't going to shut up about Jesus. Why? Because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Full of the Holy Spirit. He showed a boldness that caused the teachers to marvel. They knew that they were not educated men according to this, their standards and society standards. But yet they couldn't yet but marvel at the power that they were showing. Man does not qualify you. God does. That's what I read in my Bible. <laughs> no matter what man tells me about me, I'm not being qualified by you or your certificates that are collecting dust, by the way. I'm qualified by God. You are qualified by God. Jesus qualified these people himself. He didn't call them because they were qualified. Do you see that? He qualified them. He called them and then qualified. He equipped them. He prepared them. Aren't you pleased? I'm pleased. I'm thankful that God, man, thank you, Jesus, that you'll take somebody like me and use me to be part of something like this. I was in the worship today. Man, what a time of praise and worship. You don't know the miracle that you guys are. You don't know how many people here were prayed for. You don't know what it is to be in a place where we are like, where we've been hardly anyone. And then suddenly you're full of people just shouting the name of Jesus, praising God. What a miracle that is, especially in the times that we're in. People standing for Jesus. The sun, the sun's been out over the last, over Easter, yeah? People still came and worshiped God. They could have gone, you know, they could have gone to the beach. People still said, nah. Jesus is more important. Gathering together with you guys is a privilege. Seeing God move in your lives is a privilege. And a privilege that isn't stopping soon. We're going to see more and more growth in you guys. Growth in me. Because God is qualifying us. God is qualifying us. Isn't that humbling? Man, thank you, Jesus. Humbles me. Amazingly, in this passage, it says that the people saw the boldness in Peter and John and marveled. They marveled. This is a massive part that you need to get from this. We learned that they were being filled. Yeah, we can read it. They were filled at Pentecost. We don't know if they were filled in between, but we know that they were filled again. Here. We know it. We can read it for ourselves. We know it's an ongoing thing. You can read it. But what is even more important is that they ask for more boldness. You don't arrive ever. You don't arrive ever. You don't suddenly go, I made it. I'm, I am the ultimate Christian. <laughs> it's like, um, oh yeah, um, we have tears here. We've got a few ultimate Christians. We, you know, they only come out now and then to spend time with the peasants. You know? <laughs> because they're ultimate Christians. 
you're never going to make it. These are Peter and John, yeah? Stood up, preached a sermon, went to some kind of prison, yeah? Some kind of holding cell or something, and they were told, shut up, don't talk anymore. They were arrested. Don't talk about Jesus anymore. And they said, whether it's better to listen to you or God, you decide, but we ain't shutting up. Yeah? Boldness. Is that not boldness? I think it is. Yeah? Boldness to preach in front of thousands of people and boldness to make a stand that may cost you your life. That's boldness. I think we can read that. And even if you can't read it between the lines, it says it in black and white that they marveled at their boldness. Okay? Okay? Yeah? So then when you're going through this, we're working out our salvation, not ticking boxes. Yeah? You're not ticking boxes. Singing in tongues? Check. Tell someone about Jesus? Check. Ultimate boldness? Check. Making a stand for my faith? Check. Check. Get a donkey? Check. Yeah. It's not a checklist. I had boldness in 1997. And ever since then, I've had boldness. No, it, it, it left. Yeah. What you needed to do was ask God for more. Because your brothers, 2,000 years ago, did. And they walked with Jesus. So if they're asking for more, you definitely need to ask for more. I don't understand it. I used to be like this. I used to be so on fire for Jesus. Yeah, and then you stopped asking for more. <laughs> it's not difficult. You let the battery run out. What was powerful? What was powerful and could be used in a mighty way? Became completely useless. Because you stopped asking. You stopped asking for God. To do more. Isn't complacency in Christianity probably one of the, the biggest weapons of the enemy? To think that we're doing all right? These guys, I can't emphasize it enough. These guys were arrested for their faith and told to stop talking about Jesus. And people were marveling at the boldness that they had to even stand against these so-called teachers and educated people. And they're like, these guys aren't even educated. And yet they are so bold. They, had, they marveled. When God gets hold of a life, he turns the whole thing upside down. And he takes what's peculiar. And the word says you're, you're peculiar. And he'll use you. He'll take the foolish things of this world, yeah, and he'll do it to change things, to confuse the wise. I don't mind being foolish if it leads people to Jesus, if it makes people marvel. I'm thankful that Jesus has qualified me, not man. And yet, they're here. They've got it. I mean, if does anyone read this passage and be like, man, I wish I had the boldness of Peter and John? Does anyone read it like that? I do. I wish I could have their boldness. Man, I wish I could just... If someone was speaking like that, and I was being threatened with my life, and it says that they were, they were reprimanded, that they were probably beaten and hurt, and they were still, they still kind of said, no, we ain't backing down. Man, I want that boldness. You want that boldness, Sats? Yeah, I want that boldness. So why then, if they wanted that boldness, Sats, right, did they ask for more? Amen, sister. Because it's an everyday thing. His mercies are new every morning. Give us our day, our daily bread. Give us what we need. Give us what will sustain us today. Give us what we need to get through today. So what you had yesterday isn't for today. And they got it. They understood it. They had it. We can read it. And yet they came back to church. They came back to all their gathering with all their people. And they started saying, Lord, this world is a mess. These people are, these people hate you. These people hate us. <sighs> okay, we see the picture that it is. Can you give us more boldness 
to keep making that stand. And they even say, so you can use us to heal people, which they'd already just done. Yeah. You healed one person. Well, prayed for someone that got healed and God did the work. Yeah. And then you're like a healer. <laughs> they asked, Lord, help us continue to do that. It's when we stop and we think we become something. What we do is we then label it a ministry. Come to Rich's Healing Ministry. So far, one successful healing. Yeah? Because God used you. Because you said, God, will you use me? And then God gave you an opportunity. And then you were used by God. And then God, guess what? Backed you up on it. And he did something with it. That doesn't make you a healer. But it doesn't mean you can't go and pray for the next person, the next person, the next person. But are you asking God to give you that? Or are you already there? Because they already showed they had boldness quite a few times. And yet, they still ask for more. This is the lesson today, church. To be being filled isn't just to be filled with the Holy Spirit. See, people think to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be like, oh, then I went and prayed for the sick and walked on water and, uh, you know, fed the 5,000 with some fish fingers and a loaf of bread. Yeah? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, that's, that, that stuff. Like, maybe God will do that stuff. It means be being filled so you can overcome your addiction. Be being filled so you can just get through the day. Be being filled so you can be equipped to work with your family. Be being filled, yeah? It's not, we make it this big super spiritual kind of crazy thing. It's a command of God. It's something that God has put in us to say, if you, do, if you stop being filled, then you're going to get dry. And if you get dry, then it's just going to stop. And then it's going to get rusty. And then you're going to have a lot of things going wrong. And it ain't going to work. And then you've got to do a massive remodeling job to get that working again before you can even put the fuel in to start it again. <laughs> Anyone done that? Everyone's like, that's me, that's my life. Yeah, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the reality of it is, if we keep allowing it to be filled, we can keep going. We can keep moving. We can keep going. Like I said, it's up to God whether he puts you on the fast, the descent, the ascent. You know, whether you're, whether you're running fast, whether you're, you're walking. That, let him set the pace. But you need the power. You want to know why the church is compromising? Why there is moaning in the church rather than encouragement? People have ignored the Bible. They've decided that the need for the Holy Spirit is an option that they don't want to take up. The Holy Spirit is not an option. I'm sad to say that that's unfortunately what's happened. I'm glad that I'm preaching on this today and teaching today, and I pray that this will become a, a message you remember. Because we need power. We need power to overcome many things. And that can only come from God. Because I tried it in my own power, anyone else? And it did not work. So if I need to overcome something, I need a power that is not of this world. I need a power that is not of me. And I need it every day. Amen, sister. No power to continually change means that we stagnate and we very soon end up compromising and moaning. You'll see these people a mile off. We become complainers. We become people who can decide that not only is the Holy Spirit an optional extra, but that the Bible now itself is optional. This is happening right now in this world. Really is happening. Do you know why? Because if you stop being filled and you stop gathering... And you stop being around those that are going to encourage you, just like we saw Peter and John do. You end up being on your own, with your own brain. Now I want to say, anyone on their own with their own brain, me included, is not going to work out very well. Anyone else testify to that? You want to know why the world is a mess right now? Because they had two years in isolation. Yeah, this, this is a big battlefield. And that's why God's saying... So, so can you imagine, they went through all that process. They were then told to shut up. And the first place they go to is their church family, their companions. They needed to get around them, and they said, we need to pray. And then it says they were filled. The place shook. And they asked for more. God, equip us then. If this world sucks this much, God, we need more of you than ever. That's what you read it through. It's 
paraphrase, but read that through. Man, it says they're going to come against you. If this is what's going to happen, then we need your power more than ever to change this world. Lord, will you come? They didn't go there with arrogance. They didn't go in there saying, you don't know what we've already achieved. You need what we've got. You need boldness. They said that they marveled at our boldness. You guys need, mar- you need boldness. They came in and said, we need more. If we're going to overcome this world, if we're going to reach people that do not know Jesus, if we're going to take people from darkness into light. If we're going to be used by God to do that, we need God. We need his power. And we end up with broken church, and we end up with a powerless church, and powerless Christians who do not fill people with wonder, but instead enable people to sin in the name of Jesus. Shall I read that again? We become complainers, and we become people who can decide that not only is the Holy Spirit an optional extra, but the Bible itself is now optional. Or is full of suggestion rather than commands. And then we end up with a broken church that is powerless and powerless Christians who do not fill people with wonder, but instead enable people to sin in the name of Jesus. What Christian are you? We need to be being filled. We need to enable God to continually fill us to transform us, to equip us, and give us what we need, our daily bread, every day. And even if today was the most boldest day in your life for Jesus, still ask God for more boldness. Humble yourself and pray. Ask God, Lord, it wasn't about me. You gave me that. So why do I think it's about me, God? So Lord, I need more. Get greedy for those things. Stop asking for cars and money and health. Ask God for boldness. Hope, trust, wisdom. Ephesians 5, 18 to 21. Nearly there. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 18. Do not be drunk with wine, in which, dissipation, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all the things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. The days are evil. It's our responsibility to stand and to be a light in the darkness and through the ev- through the evil in this world, that the world evil in this world would marvel at the power of the church. Is that happening? It needs to happen. It needs this world ain't changing without the power of God. And the world ain't seeing the power of God if you ain't connecting yourself to that power. This passage says, do not be drunk with wine. That includes beer, spirits, cider, if you're Bristolian. <laughs> I like it how people will read that and go, oh, it's all right to get drunk on beer because um, it's not written in the Bible. <laughs> yes, genius, well done. Um, but be filled with the spirit. I don't want to focus on the drunkenness. Think about this. Drunkenness leads to a loss of sense. It leads to being out of control. It causes us to crash at times. It can cause us to become aggressive. It can lead us to do things we wouldn't do or to hurt ourselves or to hurt others. And often we can wake up and not even remember what happened. Yeah? Who, who drank? I can, yeah? <laughs> it was like, yeah, 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 yeah. It says, do not be drunk, but instead be filled with the Spirit. I don't think we need to focus on the, dr- the drunkenness thing as much it's a command not to do but the reality of it is is actually what it's showing is don't do this thing but be filled with the holy spirit don't intoxicate yourself with this stuff to get you through life 
but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Not just, not just alcohol. Don't be intoxicated. Don't be controlled. Don't be manipulated by this stuff, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instead of letting that person dictate who you are, be filled with the Holy Spirit instead. Yeah? Instead of allowing that addiction to rule you, be filled with the Holy Spirit instead. Instead of allowing that mindset to control you or that past mistake or what happened to you in your past dictate who you are, instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah? We need to stop putting our eyes upwards to the Lord and instead, and stop, instead of looking downwards at ourselves. When we suddenly shift, people don't like this kind of preaching because it doesn't pander to their, oh, but what about me? But the reality of it is, there is an all-powerful God that has done everything he needs to do to change your life, to change your circumstances, and to set you free. So if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, yeah, then you don't focus on being drunk or being filled with something else, whatever that may be. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, which enhances our senses. Does it not? It gives us discernment. It gives us responsibility. Yeah? Suddenly we're like, oh, I can't just say what I like. I might have to think in my head not to say what's about to come out of my mouth because the Holy Spirit is in me because he filled me. And actually he's saying, don't do that. Yeah? It teaches us to do the right thing. It gives us responsibility. It gives us an awareness to do the, to do, um, do the things that we do. It brings us conviction to do the right thing. Or not to do the wrong thing. Yeah? So when we're walking with God and we're like, I think I'm going to do that thing that my flesh really wants to do. Suddenly you're like, no. And you're like, good one, Holy Spirit. Yeah? But if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, who's winning the war? Your flesh. It's easy. And I'm not talking to you like, you guys are all in the flesh. You need to get like me. I'm like, I know. I'm with you in it. Yeah? When we let the flesh dictate who we are, the spirit is no voice. There's no discernment. There's no conviction. There's no challenge. There's no change. And the flesh wins. Yeah? That's a good word. I think it's a good word. It's not even my word. It's God's. I can't even take credit for it, but it's a good word. Good job, Lord. It brings us conviction to do the right thing. He fills us with power to walk in a manner worthy of Jesus Christ. Yeah? We are filled with a power to walk worthy of what Jesus has done for us. That then people would marvel at what they see in you because they see really Jesus. And you can say, yeah. Let me tell you about my Jesus. My, no, my Jesus. <laughs> Let me tell you about our Jesus. Is that right? Better, better, okay. we'll be, can we be friends again now? Yeah. <laughs> that people would marvel at how you live in comparison to those who get drunk and live in the world. Yeah? Think about your life. How does it honor Jesus? Is it filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you being equipped by God every day to have the power you need to overcome the things that you're facing? Or are you just looking at the mountain going, oh. <laughs> when there's a God that says, if you just have faith as a mustard seed, this can go. And we're just looking at the circumstance because we're in the flesh. Or we're in our pit. Or we're in our cave. Or we're in our hole. You want to know why you're having problems in your life? It's really simple. You're just not being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because I know from example... That when I'm being filled with the Holy Spirit, when I'm letting God come and do the work he needs to do, people can say stuff to me that really irritates me. Just things that I'm like, man, I just want to, you know? And then God says, you need to chill a bit. You need, to, you need to think about you. You need to look at your sin. That's what the Holy Spirit does, is it? Isn't it? People come at you and th people can do things, but the reality of it is you come away and you go, if you're allowing God to do a work in you, you're like, hang on a minute. Why well, am I so focused on these people? I need to work out my own salvation. That's what it told me. So actually, God, sorry, reset, show me what I need to sort out.
Forgive me, Lord. Maybe even go and ask forgiveness from somebody. Yeah? That's what the Holy Spirit does. But when he's not in your life, it's just called stew. Yeah? And not a nice casserole. Not one of those really nice beef stews. It's a disgusting, snotty, filthy, disgusting stew. Because that's what we do. We just stew in it. If your name's stew, sorry. <laughs> but I'm just saying, isn't that what happens? Isn't that what happens when we don't let the Holy Spirit fill us, change us, convict us, mold us? Is that we just stew in our sin. And we call it Christianity. And then we call it Jesus. The word be filled is translated to, by many to mean continually filled in that passage. If you look into the uh, Greek um, where it says be filled and, and expand it, it's about a continuality in other, pas- other Bible translations. They actually put that word in there. Be continually filled. So we need to continually be filled. It's right there. Acts 1 verse 8. This is the end. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, all of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The simple question for you today and the challenge for the rest of your life is are you full of power? Not powerful, that's Jesus. But are you full of power? Because if your life is not going the way you think, I just want to challenge you, what is your relationship to the Holy Spirit like? How vulnerable before him? Not church, not man, not systems or programs or The Holy Spirit himself, how vulnerable are you being with him? How are you allowing him to change you? It says through the Holy Spirit we have the word written on our hearts. Has anyone noticed that when you got saved, suddenly you were being convicted by scripture you'd never read? I did. Maybe I'm the only one. But I was like, what is that? And then later on you're like, that was a scripture? The church needs to stop. The church needs to stop removing the word of God through the Holy Spirit from their life. The church needs to stop compromising. The church needs to allow the conviction of the word of God to do what it should do. Whether you like it or not. And I'm right there in front of the queue. We had a men's gathering on Monday. Ian brought a video. We watched the video, and I came away going, man, Holy Spirit, why are you here right now? I don't want to hear any of that stuff. I don't want to change. Yeah? It's not that we're not wrestling. Our flesh, our spirit, our ego, who we are, with what God wants. It's not that it's not that we just go... Oh, he wanted me to change? Okay. I'm in, Lord. Like you're like the keener. Probably like John, the one that Jesus loved, yeah? You know? <laughs> it's, not, it's not like that. It's hard, isn't it? But it doesn't make it not fact. It doesn't mean it's not truth. And it doesn't mean God isn't on your case or the Holy Spirit is not on your case to change. And what we do when God is changing us or challenging us to change is we then attack. I know it because I do it and I know you do it. Yeah? We attack. We go, oh, yeah, well, it's not really about um, me, is it? You know? It's about really you, isn't it? It's about what you did and what you didn't do. And, and you're like, really? It's just like, just, it's all right. It's cool. I can see that God's on your case. It's okay. You know? It's all right. It's okay to be vulnerable. Yeah? And we've been learning that a lot as a church, and we will continue to learn that more as a church. When we allow God to come and move by his power, and we allow the word of God to do what it really should do, it will change our church, which will then change this world. This is what happens. 
I was in the men's gathering this Monday and it was like, at the end of it, thankfully you ladies are not here, there, but at the end of it, people said, man, I need to treat my wife better. And they didn't mean, they weren't saying it just for lip service. They weren't saying, oh, I need to treat my wife better. So you didn't think I'm treating my wife better. It was like, man, I need, I've got to go, I've got to go do some homework. I've got to go, I've got to go now, bye. You know, I've got to go do something. Other people were like, man, that, the way that that has spoken to me means I've got to change my whole way of, th my whole way of thinking. Yeah? This is what the word God does. Sometimes you're like, no, this is my train. This is what I'm going on. And God's like, no, you need to shift. You need to shift here. And you're like, no, this is what I've always believed. This is what I'm always on. I've always had this main, and he says, yeah, that's called stubbornness. I've been working on that for a while. It's time to change track. And then you're like, man, I have to change that thing. My way of thinking, how I treat someone. This is what the Holy Spirit does. And this is what the word of God does. So what I left.